Hello, and welcome to Reimagining Love. I'm Dr. Alexandra Solomon. Relationships have the power to wound us and the power to heal us. As a clinical psychologist, author, and professor at Northwestern University, I've devoted my life to studying intimate partnerships and family dynamics. On Reimagining Love, I'm here to translate complex clinical topics into tools and takeaways that you can use in your relationships today. If you're ready to develop relational self-awareness and create vibrant and loving relationships with the people who matter most to you, you've come to the right place. I'm so glad that you're here. Welcome to the first Reimagining Love episode of 2024. I have a hunch that you are still in those blurry, family-filled, travel-filled, carb-filled holiday days. If you're a parent, you likely are still booty deep in kids and, uh, you know, just structuring days that are quite unstructured. You might still be traveling. So therefore, I do not want to overwhelm you with a really meaty episode on a day such as this day. So we're going to keep it easy peasy today. I'm going to first share a few thoughts about New Year's resolutions. Then I'm going to guide you through two practices that are designed to help you get oriented to the new year. As we often do with these solo episodes, we have created a companion worksheet that outlines the reflection questions that I'm going to be guiding you through in just a few moments here. And usually you need to become a newsletter subscriber to access the worksheet. But for today's episode, all you're going to have to do is go to the direct link to the worksheet, which you'll find in the show notes. But if you are a newsletter subscriber, which I hope that you are by now, you're also going to get the worksheet in my weekly newsletter. So in terms of how you listen today, I invite you to use these exercises in whatever way ends up being most helpful for you. My favorite vision for you is that you get yourself super cozy right now, like a journal, maybe the worksheet, you print it out, put it next to you, grab something to write with, put yourself under a blanket, get some tea, a candle, a fire in the fireplace, you know, you get the vibe. (laughs) And then listen to the episode and press pause between the questions or prompts as we do them. And then just let yourself do some really nice stream of consciousness journaling. Alternatively, you could listen to the episode now and then find a separate time to sit down with that worksheet. I love the idea, if you are partnered, of using this episode to have a conversation between the two of you around reflecting on the year we've just had, stepping into the new year together. If you go that route, I'm going to suggest that each of you do some reflecting on your own, do these exercises on your own, and then come together and share your responses. If you do decide to talk together, please just make sure that you resist the urge to correct or edit or debate what your partner has come up with in their reflection journey. Just let yourself take it in. If you end up finding that something that they shared really continues to sit poorly with you, then raise it separately at a separate time and in a gentle way. Ideally, you would use the feedback wheel I think that if you've been listening to the show for a while, you know that I really love the feedback wheel, which was originally created by Janet Hurley and was really popularized by my friend Terry Real. The feedback wheel goes like this. It's four elements of giving feedback. One, this is what I recollect happened. Two, this is what I made up about it. Three, this is what I felt. Four, this is what would help me feel better. So if you decide to come back to your partner and say, you know, when we did (laughs) Dr. Alexandra's reflections, something you shared just isn't sitting very well with me. I'd like to talk to you about it. And then use the feedback wheel to give them the feedback. And also remember 
that if you and your partner reflect separately, come together, have a conversation, something sits poorly, you want to bring it up, before you bring it up with your partner, take that opportunity to also practice some relational self-awareness. Check in with yourself. What is the fear or the judgment that what my partner shared stirs up in me? Right? What is it about what my partner shared that troubles me? What is the specific fear I have? What is the specific critique I have? Like, why for me was my partner's share troubling, disturbing, upsetting? Okay. What's the kind of source of that? What does my partner's share remind me of from my own past, either in a prior relationship, in my family of origin? And remember that Our relationships are stronger when we are willing to again and again and again be students of our own reactivity. So however you choose to use this episode, I think it's a great idea to start the new year with intentionality and to carve some time out to be generous and gentle with yourself. Okay, so before we get to the interactive part of the episode, I want to share with you some of the feelings that I have about resolutions. The new year is historically a time when we reflect on the year we had, look ahead to the new year, the sort of like blank page for us, a chance to make amends, a chance to move forward with a new sense of purpose and intention. And for a whole lot of us, that means we make one or more New Year's resolutions. There's a psychologist named Dr. John Norcross, and he's been studying New Year's resolutions for about 30 years. He recently did an interview on NPR on the topic of New Year's resolutions and the tradition. So interestingly, here's what he says about why do we make New Year's resolutions? He says, quote, worshipers in ancient Roman times would offer resolutions of good conduct to the god Janus, J-A-N-U-S who was a two-faced deity who would look both backwards and forwards. And since that time, it's become a socially sanctioned time when the plate is clean and everyone has a new opportunity, end quote. So me personally, I'm pretty meh on the whole idea of resolutions. Norcross's research indicates that after six months, about 40% of people are sticking to their resolutions. I mean, I guess if you're a glass half full sort of person, 40% is not bad. That's a lot of folks who are still turning their idea into action six months later. I think that for me, my feeling of meh about resolutions is that failing to accomplish your resolutions can end up becoming a source of shame, guilt, self-criticism. I also don't want us to feel limited to this time of year to start new habits. I think that we get to do that whenever we want. And the time may not be ripe. Like just because the calendar says January 1st, the timing for you may not be right to make a new behavioral commitment. I think also this year, feeling particularly a little doubtful or cynical about New Year's resolutions because I set two ambitious and ill-fated fitness goals for myself January 1st of 2023. And I went so far as to make them public by sharing on Instagram. Like, what the hell was I thinking? And I knew at the time, I was like, okay, well, I really am making this public. I really am claiming this. And I, I came up short. My two goals, just FYI, were I was going to get my first ever pull-up and I was going to get my first ever 200-pound deadlift. Years ago, I got to 195. I never got to that 200. And I didn't do it. I didn't meet either goal. I technically got within spitting distance of that deadlift goal, but here's the deal. I did not make the commitments that I would have needed to make to meet those goals. There were daily and weekly practices that I would have had to commit to to meet those goals. And I I made a declaration without the kind of depth and specificity that was required. So my job now, here we are in the fresh start of a new year, my job now is to meet that truth that last year's resolutions did not pan out for me, to meet that truth with self-compassion and figure out where I go from here. And as far as I can see, I've got three choices. Number one, just opt out of any sort of New Year's resolution or goal for myself this year. Option two, create a goal for myself that is more aligned with the realities of my bandwidth and the realities of my priorities in this moment. And option three, 
would be to create the necessary shifts around bandwidth, around priorities, and to do that in such a way that I could actually reach whatever ambitious goal I might imagine setting for myself, right? So a goal is only as good as the structures you put in place to support you moving towards that goal. So I'm wanting you, (laughs) what I want for you is that you bring gentleness to this transition. There's just so much turmoil in our world today. There's so much urgency, despair, confusion, polarization. I don't know that any of us ought to be expecting ourselves to be living our best life right now or figuring out the energy we're bringing into 2024 or figuring out our goals. I don't think we have to be doing that. Moving through our days with ease, minimizing urgency, like what if that's enough? So what if we set our sights on gentleness and kind of move from there? The research has shown again and again that the most common New Year's resolutions have to do with our bodies, losing weight, eating healthier, getting more exercise. In fact, Forbes does this annual study about New Year's resolutions and they gather data this year from a thousand Americans. The top resolution this year was to improve fitness. A full 48% of people listed that as their top resolution. Going from there, the next one was improve finances, then improve mental health, weight loss, improve diet. So of those top five, three of the five have to do with bodies. I want us to be really mindful of how we talk about and goal set around our bodies. I think it's so easy for us to bring criticism and judgment to these bodies of ours. So if you're going to make changes in the new year, please ensure that they are guided by love. I need and deserve movement and nourishing choices, for example, rather than loathing. I'm not okay as I am. I've let myself go. I have to make it different, right? There's the energy you hear me talk all the time about motivation being the energy of love versus the energy of fear. What are we moving towards versus what are we, you know, trying to avoid? And so if you're moving towards a sense that your body deserves, you you deserve to feel good in your body. Your body deserves to be treated with kindness and respect. And one of the ways that manifests is in the form of prioritizing movement. I love it. Versus the idea of avoid, avoiding the shame of these extra five pounds or avoiding the perceived judgment by living in a body that is larger than you think it should be. So just kind of checking in with your motivation. What's motivating this goal of yours? And remember to create changes that are small and specific. So the idea of a goal like 20 minutes of exercise four times a week is, I think, better than lose 30 pounds. Right. Just what is the, what's the little edge that you can take on? My, (laughs) my pull up goal was more than I ought to have taken on, given that I didn't have the bandwidth and the plan of how I was going to enact that. And make sure that you're patient. According to Norcross's research, it takes about three months for a change to become a routine. So I have not decided fully whether I'll set a goal for the new year and what it's going to be. But I do know that if I do set something, it's going to be designed to create more consistency in my workouts because I know that the consistency itself and the workouts themselves both deeply, deeply support my well-being. And so if you create a New Year's resolution, I hope it's guided by these two questions. And these are questions that you are going to ask yourself, please. Question one, to what degree is this resolution of mine guided by my love for myself versus my fear that I'm not enough as I currently am? If your resolution is guided by love, carry on. I love that for you. If your resolution is guided by criticism, see how you might opt instead for self-compassion rather than a resolution. Question two, what are the structures, habits, and practices that put the wind at my back so I make it as easy as possible to integrate this resolution into my life? With this new year of ours, we are also beginning a little bit of a new chapter here on reimagining love. It's not dramatic, but it is fun. Since starting the podcast over two years ago at this point, I have begun 
every conversation with our guest experts by asking them about a growing edge they're currently working on in one of their important relationships and what has been teaching them these days. You've heard me ask it (laughs) many, 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 many times, right? The growing edge question, the relational self-awareness question. So I have loved, loved, loved this question because I think it highlights that all of us, even experts on relationships, are constantly working through new challenges. I love the way that the growing edge question captures this dialectic that we are whole as we are and we are works in progress, like this bodacious blend of gifts and growing edges. So I love what that question has captured for so long. But my team and I decided we would change it up a little bit. So instead of framing the question that I'm going to be asking all of our guests on the show around a challenge, we're now framing the question in terms of possibility. So the question is now, how are you currently reimagining love in one of your important relationships. I'm excited about this question. I think this question is going to invite the sort of feeling of curiosity and possibility and discovery that we know lives at the heart of all great relationships. So I think this question really brings that forward and taps into it. I'm excited for us to hear what my guests are curious about in their relationships. I'm excited for us to hear about perhaps a new possibility that our guest has discovered or is exploring in their relationship. I'm excited for us to perhaps hear about an old belief of theirs or an old idea of theirs that they're currently letting go of or transforming so that they can reimagine love. So stay tuned for that in the coming weeks. And with that in mind, I invite you to explore what it means for you to reimagine love. So I have two exercises for you today. These exercises are designed to help you cultivate relational self-awareness through the practices of reflection, integration, and declaration. I love this idea at the new year of just declaring some stuff. What are you declaring for yourself, for your relationships in the new year? So again, use these exercises in whatever way is most comfortable for you. You're going to be able to find the link to the worksheet in the show notes that outlines these questions and these prompts. Okay. Are you ready? Are you cozy? Are you comfy? Exercise one. For this first exercise... I'm going to take you through 10 sentence completions. So feel free to press pause and write after each of these. One, as I put 2023 in the rearview mirror, I am grateful that I experienced. Two, as I put 2023 in the rearview mirror, I mourn the loss of. Three, as I put 2023 in the rearview mirror, I am proud of myself for. Number four, as I step in to 2024, I will leave behind that which is no longer serving me. What I am leaving behind is. Five, as I step into 2024. I will embrace that which nourishes me. What I will practice choosing for myself is... Six, as I step into 2024, a dream I have for myself is... Seven, as I step into 2024, a relationship that I want to deepen is... Number eight, as I step into 2024, the feeling I want to cultivate in the people I love is nine. As I step into 2024, I am excited about 10. My guiding word this year is hope as you work on these that you don't feel like any of it has to be grand or comprehensive or, you know, 
the greatest thing ever. It's just, what's the little edge for you? What's that little dream for you, that wish, that shift? You're welcome to keep it small and keep it simple and just keep it real. I hope these questions have given you a chance to celebrate yourself, to reflect on your growth in the past year, to claim what you desire for yourself and the people you love in the coming year. All right, exercise number two. Our second exercise is an invitation for you to write a letter to yourself. Like I can literally imagine you doing, dear self, and going from there. So write this in the form of a love letter, if you will. I can imagine you writing it in the next couple of days and then tucking it away until this time next year, perhaps even. I want you to write about this past year as a chapter in the bigger story of your life. What were the major themes this year? Who were the heroes and the villains? What were the major conflicts this year and the resolutions to those conflicts or the ways in which those conflicts got carried and held and placed within the larger context of your life this year? What were the victories? What were the disappointments? What were the surprising plot twists? What were the turning points? The times when it was looking like this, something happened and it started to head in a different direction. What were the lessons learned this year? What I love so much about this exercise, which is really pulling for narrative and story, it's just the way that we think and we are anyways. We are meaning-making creatures by our very nature. So storytelling is an incredibly healing practice for us. It's a really intuitive practice for us. Storytelling is how we go from confusion to clarity It's how we go from discomfort to greater comfort. It's how we go from criticism to grace is by creating a story around something that happens so that we can kind of hold it a little more easily inside of our minds and our hearts. So I like the ways that storytelling helps us make sense of what we've been through and opens us up to what lies ahead. And writing about your year is a self-reflective exercise. It grows your awareness about what matters to you, what's difficult for you, what's going well for you. And from that place of awareness, you get to make choices on a daily and weekly and monthly basis that serve your highest good. In conclusion, I hope that you are entering 2024 with a sense of ease and connection to yourself and to the people who are around you. I'm grateful to you for being part of this community. And if you are a fan of the show, if this show has helped you or held you or supported you or taught you something this year, it would mean the absolute world to me and to my team. If you would leave a review on whatever podcast platform you listen to this show on and or share an episode that you have enjoyed with a loved one. I hope today's episode felt supportive and I hope that reimagining love continues to have a place in your world. I hope it continues to be a source of inspiration and guidance in the coming year. I'm sending you so much love as we enter this new year together. Okay, until next time, be well. Reimagining Love is produced and edited by Emily Reeves. Our theme music was composed by Slade Warnkin. Do you have a relationship question that you want answered on the show? Visit reimagininglove.com to send in a written or audio question. Questions can be about intimate partnerships, family relationships, friendships, you name it. If you're looking for more love and relationship content, you can find me on Instagram at dr.alexandra.solomon or visit my website, dralexandrasolomon.com where you'll find my blog as well as the Intimate Relationships 101 e-course based off of the popular class I teach at Northwestern University. Thank you for listening and see you next week here on Reimagining Love.